morning, friends. We're going to begin this morning with a new song. Um, some of you may have heard it, but it's new to our congregation. The lyrics will be up on the screen so you can follow along. Let's praise God together this cold Sunday morning.
Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service of worship. Those who are gathered in the room and those who are gathering with us online, it's good to be together even on a chilly Sunday morning. As we come together, I have a couple of things that I would share. Um, on the table in the back there behind Danny uh, are our star words for 2023. This is the last week that the star words will be out. If you've not had a star word, there's a little bit of a brochure back there. It's a kind of a whimsical spiritual practice to invite you to consider how God might be speaking a new and fresh word into your life through just a simple word. Uh, the, again, there's some information back there. I invite you to avail yourself of that. I want to welcome to our worship Tony Rollett. Uh, Tony is uh, going to be with us for the next couple of weeks as uh, uh, Lucas, uh, Lucas is on a cruise in, uh, I think, in the Caribbean. His band is like doing a, a cruise for a couple weeks. So uh, this is, uh, I have the wrong gig. But uh, anyway, we're glad that Tony is here to make that organ do some of what it ought to do. Uh, tonight, um, a reminder, I've spoken to many of you, but if, if you are in seventh grade and older, uh, this uh, confirmation experience begins this evening. Uh, at five o'clock, we'll gather for dinner and we'll stay right through youth group. Uh, so if, uh, if you're in seventh grade or older and you want to talk about that, let me know or just show up downstairs at five o'clock tonight. A reminder that uh, we have new office, uh, a new office administrator, a Andy's here, and uh, she's going to be trying to put together a runner in the a church newsletter in the next week or so. So if you have something that you would like to get in there, Andy is new enough that she doesn't know she's supposed to chase you and hound you and do what you promised to do. So just go ahead and do it or consider this all the hounding you need to get stuff in for the runner. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if you've been here more than once, you know that uh, almost every week we uh, are led in worship by a variety of voices. If you or one of your children um, would like to be a lay reader in worship, we have all kind of space. You can talk to me about that and we'll find a date that can work. I think that's all the announcements that we have. I will invite you now to stand as Brian invites us into worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Alleluia. Come and praise, you servants of God. Praise the name of the Lord. May God's, May God's name be blessed, blessed both, both now and, and forever. forever. From east to west, from north to south, praise the name of the Lord. May, May God's, God's name be blessed, blessed both now and forever. Who can compare to our God? Seated high above the nations of the earth, God's glory fills the skies. May God's name be blessed both now and forever. Let us worship the Lord.
Please join me for the prayer of confession, which will include a time for silent reflection. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. And we continue. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth, admit our sin, and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. This is the good news we have to declare. God leads us out of the shadows to walk in the light of Christ. This is the word we have heard. Our faithful God forgives our sins and raises us to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, whose name is to be chosen above great riches, we trust in you. Your love surrounds us like great mountains, and your care fills the poor of this world with hope. Lead us to discern your side in the present circumstances, that we may have courage to serve with Christ, not counting the cost. Amen. The first reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 31 through 43. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda, where he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, he said, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately he got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so, when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, and all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed there for some time with a tanner named Simon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Could I ask the children to come forward for a few minutes, please?
what, let's slide everybody down a little bit this way. Keep sliding down a little bit. There you go, Ezra, you can come and sit right next to your brother. All right, well, you slid. You don't need to slide anymore, Declan. You're in good shape. Oh, blame it on your older brother. That's a good strategy. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Here's what I'd like you to do. Answer this out loud. Just think in your heads. Think of somebody that you love. Oh, don't answer out loud. That's in your head. Think about somebody that you care about, that you love. Just put your hand up if you can think of somebody that you love. Okay, I see some hands. Now, also in your head, think about if you wanted to show that person that you care for them, what would you do? So you're already thinking of one person, and now you're thinking, how could I tell that person, how could I show that person that I care? Does anybody have any, any would anybody like to tell me who you're thinking of and what you would do? What do you think you would You love your mom so much. How would you show your mom that you love her? How can you show her? Okay. How many of you were thinking that maybe you could give a gift to somebody that you love? Maybe. Okay. Declan, what would you like to say? Okay, do not throw the things that you love. That's a good thing to know. That's good. What do you think? Who were you thinking of? You love your brother and your mom, and how would you show them that you love them? Yeah, hugs. Did you, anybody else think of hugs? Hugs are a good way to show love, aren't they? Especially if the person you're hugging likes to be hugged. Okay, thank you for telling me that. So, let me ask you to think about this. Now, the Bible verse, I don't know if anybody's paying attention to the Bible verse that Mr. Brian read, but he was reading a story about a person whose name was Tabitha, and Tabitha loved the people that were with her. She loved her neighbors, and she showed them how she loved them. Does anybody remember how she showed them that she loved them? You forget. She showed them that she loved them by making them clothes. They were, they were people who they didn't have enough clothes all the time, and so Tabitha used to make them clothes and coats, and that would be a, a, a concrete way of showing that she loved them. One of the things that I think that story is in the Bible to tell us is that we can do different things to show people that we love. God tells us that we can love each other, but we don't always love each other the same way. Sometimes, like if I wanted to show you that I love you by making you clothes and you saw the clothes that I made, you would not think that I loved you <laughs> because I'm not a good clothing maker. If I gave you some clothes that I made, you would think, oh, what does Pastor Dave think is wrong with me? Does Pastor Dave think I have three legs? Look at these pants that he made for me. I'm not a good clothes maker. Tabitha was amazing at that. 
God has given you certain things that you're really good at, certain things that you're gifted for. Some of you, I know, have made pictures for people that you love because you're good artists. <laughs> Some of you maybe like to cook for people that you love. Some of you like to take walks. Just a second, this is my turn. Some of you like to take walks with people and talk with them. God invites us to always think about new ways that we can love each other and show the people that we love. I hope you'll think about that today. I have some activities for you, but first, let me invite you to pray. Will you pray with me, please? Thank you, God, for the love that we receive from you. Thank you, God, for helping us to love other people and for giving us gifts and abilities that help us to do that. Help us to do our best to love people the way that you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm so glad you're here, and I think that Matt and Campbell are going to take folks. If you'd like to go to a different room and play, I have some coloring sheets and word searches if you'd like. And this might be the first time in a long time Pastor Dave has run out of these things. So if we run low, Mr. Mack can make a couple copies, I bet. Let's see. Oh, look at this. Whew. All right. The second scripture reading this morning is Psalm 113. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you, you his servants, praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I imagine that you know what it's like to be in conversation with somebody who seems to have things together most of the time, but then every now and then they seem to launch into a story that may be wonderful in and of itself, but it has no apparent connection with anything that's actually going on in the world at the present time. It seems kind of random when you're talking with somebody and they offer up this story and then you're trying to figure out what is the context here why are we how did you draw the dots to get us to this spot in some ways i think that's exactly what's happening in today's scripture reading we have for most of this year been reading through the book of acts and uh, we have watched as luke chronicles the lives of the first jesus followers and we saw the early days of the, for this faith community in Jerusalem where Peter and John took a very large role in, in prominent leadership. We saw the church growing, the selection of the first deacons. We saw the church suffering as Stephen was murdered. And then we witnessed the community scattering as Philip was sent first to Samaria and then down to Gaza. Last week we went as far as Damascus and we saw some tremendous change in the faith community as Saul was being converted from being an enemy of Jesus into being actually a part of the Jesus movement. But this flow, which seems to be logical, you know, is, is interrupted by the insertion of a couple of apparently random stories about that time that Peter went on down to Lydda and then to Joppa. I mean, there they're fine stories, Luke, but why are you telling them now? Why are you including them in this account of the story of the church? Well, on a, on a big picture, on a communal level, I think that Luke, including these anecdotes at this juncture, helps us to see the utter 
improbability of the gospel. Each of the three people named in our text today by rights should not have found themselves doing the thing that they were doing. Peter, for instance. Here's an uneducated fisherman from the boondocks up around Galilee. We know enough about the culture and the time that we can safely assume that Peter was not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. In that place and time, as kids grew up, the most gifted of boys would receive an education first by being sent to school and then by training and apprenticing with a rabbi. But most of the other kids, including apparently Peter, would have been sent home and told to learn the family trade. And that's what Peter had been doing when he met Jesus, if you remember. He had been minding his own business, fishing, and Jesus invited him to leave that vocation behind and to become a disciple. And after investing three years of his life with Jesus, Peter finds himself in Jerusalem, face to face with the leading religious and political figures of his day. He's teaching, he's preaching, he's healing the sick. Peter, the fisherman, is now providing leadership to a new faith community. The folks back in Galilee would have probably said something like, Peter, our Peter, are you sure we're talking about the same guy? But then, as the narrative of Acts continues, Peter kind of falls out of the storyline. We don't hear anything about him for a couple of chapters. He shows up in Samaria to check on Philip, and now we find that he's in Lydda. Lydda is the low country between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea. And what's he doing there? And then why does he go to Joppa on the coast? How, how did this Sunday school dropout wind up becoming a traveling faith teacher? Similarly, Aeneas presents some questions. I mean, what was this man thinking? His doctors had been clear all along that bed rest, plenty of it, was what he needed. What's going on to prompt this old man to decide that he's not only ready, but that he is able to re-engage with household tasks? I mean, he's, he's paralyzed for crying out loud. How did it happen? And Tabitha? Tabitha, apparently, is a single woman with a head for business. She's evidently supported herself as a seamstress and a designer, as, has done so well enough not only to keep herself in one piece, but she's able to become a lifeline to the poor, the marginalized, the forgotten in her town. Now, as an unmarried woman in that culture, she had no business being an entrepreneur, let alone running a charity and relief effort. Who does she think she is to be doing all this? Well, the answer to all this, of course, is Jesus. Preacher Will Williman puts it this way. Every community, every family, every congregation exists within certain settled, fixed arrangements of power and weakness, life and death. People are told that there is a divinely established chain of being, a fixed order in which we are to find our place and stay. Tabitha is to stay home and let the men devise an affordable welfare system. Peter is to stay with his fishing nets and leave the theology to the scholars. And Aeneas should obey doctor's orders and stay in bed. But the word comes to these people in the presence of those who, like Peter, come out among them and stand with them. These miraculous events are subversive to the present order, for they announce a new age. An age where reality is not based on rigid logic or cause-effect circumstances, but on God's promise. And so every time a couple of little stories like this are faithfully told by the church, the social system of paralysis and death is rendered null and void. The presence, the promises of Jesus are life-giving, life-changing gifts. And if you have spent more than 20 minutes hanging around this place, you know that it's true. The presence and the witness of this congregation emphatically affirms that the wasting paralysis and despair of death have no place among us. And I want to invite you, friends, just to consider the realities of life in this place. In the past, 
couple of generations, a lot of smart, gifted, wealthy people have given up on Pittsburgh. Or if not the whole town, at least on the West End and Crafton Heights. These folks have considered the challenges of a changing economy, a troubled school system, all kind of worries that are punctuated by an urban landscape and have said, <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, I'll see you in Cranberry. Why in the world are you still here? This congregation should have folded a long time ago. But here you are, doing Jesus-y things. You're welcoming children and families to preschool, introducing them to the educational process with amazing care, and you're only charging parents half of what it costs you to make that stuff. Here you are, sponsoring the Open Door Youth Outreach, where those same parents and children are gifted with the opportunity to experience out-of-school and summer programming that provides tremendous enrichment for some of the most vulnerable in our city. Here you are, creating such a welcoming environment that some of your middle and high school kids showed up here this week on a school snow day and asked if they could do a little work repairing the building because they want to make sure that it's in good shape for the people who are here after they are. And these are the same kids who asked me to teach them how to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. I mean, who are you people? You are a community that bears witness to what the power of God and Jesus Christ can do. You are a community who worships a God who the psalmist says is to be praised because that God refuses to allow the poor to be forgotten or the lonely to remain so. Following the example of Christ, this community has systematically and persistently sought to be good news in and for the people in this place. You've done that. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. And all of that is amazing. For more than 12 decades, this congregation has provided people with fantastic example of faithful living and trust in God. And that's all amazing and wonderful. But I want to look a little further into the story of Tabitha to see if we can get beyond a communal understanding of this passage into a more personal application. Is there something here that might be motivational or maybe even aspirational for each of us? We mentioned the fact that Tabitha is a businesswoman, an entrepreneur. And what I find interesting about the reading today is the fact that Luke takes great pains to use the word Mathetria, Mathetria, to describe Tabitha. It's translated in, in what Brian read for you as disciple. And, and you might say, uh, Dave, I'm, I'm not sure if you're reading all that closely, but uh, you know, the word disciple is used quite a bit in the New Testament. Uh, it's kind of um, one of the main words, really, in the New Testament, Dave. Well, no kidding. Mathetes is the usual word for disciple. That one shows up 263 times in the New Testament. Yet this one, Mathetria, appears here and only here, talking about Tabitha. It's the same word as Mathetus, but Mathetria is the feminine form. Tabitha is the only person in the entire Bible for whom that word is used. And I believe this to be testimony to the impact that her life had, that the man who's writing her story had to use a new word to describe her. That offers me, and I hope you, a personal challenge. We are gifted as a community. We have a legacy that is amazing. But how do we, as individuals, live out the radical hope the unending generosity of Jesus in our own lives. You know how every now and then somebody will mention a celebrity or a politician and then the group will have to stop and think for a minute about, is that person alive or dead? 
Or maybe the news report will come on, there's an obituary, and you think like, wow, that person was still alive yesterday? Crap, I thought they died a long time ago. That's the opposite of what happens in today's reading. Tabitha is a person of whom most of the world had never heard. Yet she lived such an exemplary and impactful life that when she died, the poor in her community reached out to the most important faith leader that they could think of, the Apostle Peter. And they said, you better get here quick. You need to notice this. You need to pay attention to this woman's life. She was amazing. She saved us. Heck, she changed the world for us. To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to make it without her. Now, I can't find in this passage any request that the apostle come and raise her from the dead. I don't see them asking him for a healing. They were so impacted by, their, by her loss that they just wanted someone to notice it with them. There's an outpouring of grief wrapped in the question of, what do we do now? How are we going to survive? And as you've seen, Peter is moved. He prays. Tabitha is brought to new life. And that's amazing. But today I want to focus not on the miracle of this restored life, but rather on the impact that her life had before Peter ever showed up. Remember what we said about Tabitha. She was smart, and she worked, and she hustled, and she did all of this for the sake of the weak, the marginalized, the powerless. She gave freely to the Lord's work. She loved generously, and she was so good at living this way that when she died, she left this huge hole in her neighborhood. Can you live that way? Can I? I mean... As a congregation, I think it's pretty obvious that if this church were to close tomorrow, it would be a significant loss not only to the members, but to the community, to the city as a whole. This congregation is making a difference. Am I? Are you? Are we as individuals living lives that are so reflective of the love and presence of Jesus that folks will notice if we're not here. And if we're not, can we aspire to that? Tabitha is given two names in this passage of Scripture. Hebrew name Tabitha also mentions her Greek name Dorcas. Both of these words mean gazelle or, or deer. They refer to an animal with large, bright eyes. I titled this message, Be a Deer. In our culture, sometimes we say, Be a Deer, as a prologue to a request for some kind of a personal assistance. Be a Deer and bring me another cup of coffee, would you? Be a Deer and carry the laundry upstairs. If we stop to think about it, which of course we never do, the implication in that phrase is that you are not a deer you are unimportant to me unless you bring me the coffee or take the laundry upstairs I will love you more I will treasure you more I will value you more if you do those things for me be a deer okay I'm not asking you to do that I mean it, sure, I'll take your help with the laundry and I'd love a cup of coffee. But I'm asking you to be a deer, D-E-E-R. Be a Tabitha in the world. I'm inviting you to join me in living aspirationally so that our giving and loving and caring is so freely given that if you or I got hit by a bus today, people would notice. I'm inviting you to join me in seeking to live with such generosity of spirit, such a commitment to follow Jesus and care for the poor that we, no less than Tabitha, will change the world around us. So will you be a deer and change the world? And will you help me to be one too? This is the calling for those who belong to Jesus Christ in this community of faith, 
and for each member of it. Thanks be to God for this glorious invitation. And may we have the wisdom and the perseverance to walk joyfully in it. Amen. Friends, I'd like to uh, now invite one of those uh, young people forward, Aviva Gilaroski, to talk to us a little bit about a special mission that the youth group has undertaken. Hello and good morning. My name's Aviva Gilaroski, and every year the youth group does a 30-hour famine, and we pick um, something to fundraise for, and this year we picked to fundraise for the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So this is just a little information about that. The, Demo the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC, has a population of six billion people and has one of the fastest growth rates in the world. The DRC is the wealthiest country in terms of natural resources with mineral deposits estimated at $24 million. Despite this, one of the it's one of the poorest countries in the world or the fifth lowest GDP. GDP per capita in the United States is $65,423. GDP for, per capita in the DRC is $586. So you can see a pretty big difference there. Colonization left a good bit of Africa with haphazard borders and poor leadership. This led to cultural and ethic, ethnic tensions com, coming to a head with the Ro Rwanda genocide in 1994 also known as the genocide against the Tutsis. 
As some of this religion became more destabilized, the DRC fell into civil war and international conflict in 1996 to 1997 and 1998 to 2003. The past 20 years of peace hasn't been very peaceful with violence continuing in many religions of the country, especially in the East. Violence escalated with the invention and popularity of, techno of technology and the mining of Coltrane or the metal essential for phones, computers, and other electronics, and its rising global demand. The centralized government of the DRC has not been able to maintain control over the religion, leading to a rise in militant groups and exploitation of vulnerable populations by foreign governments. The value of, this, of these mining projects have led to widespread corruption and made it incredibly profitable for groups of governments like Rwanda, Uganda, and other well-armed militant groups to keep the religion destabilized and lawless to, ex to extract as much mineral wealth as possible. This has been particularly difficult for the children in the DRC as they have been forcefully recruited, enslaved, and otherwise exploited as soldiers working in the mine and falling victim to other atrocities. More than six million Congolese have been killed as a direct result of these conflicts. The youth group is raising money to help these kids in, that are suffering in the DRC. We are raising money to donate to all these people that are suffering. If you're part of the youth group, just lift your hand up. Me and all of these other people with their hand up, you can come to us and donate money. Every cent goes towards people suffering in the Democratic Republic of Congo because of these issues. So. That's what we talked about and that's what we learned. So any cent helps. Thank you. Thank you, Aviva. Appreciate that. We now uh, have the opportunity to share our prayer joys and concerns. Uh, our prayer families for this week include Bruce Buzet and Lydia Veltman. I invite you to pray for those folks. Also, I um, invite you to hold in prayer John Stuperitz. Many of you will know Lauren Stuperitz. Uh, her dad, John, had a fall while he was here in Pittsburgh, but the rest of the family was out of state. And so she has been texting from Virginia uh, wondering about care for her dad and how things are going uh, and just uh, it, it, so Lauren has some anxiety and her dad has some health issues. <clears throat> also prayers uh, for Becky Hefner's dad. Uh, is he still at Jefferson? Yeah, he's having a visit for a couple of Okay, hospitalized at Jefferson and experiencing some complications following abdominal surgery. Are there other things that you would share this morning? Michelle. Thank you. Don't worry, I didn't hit anybody's car today. <laughs> 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 You're welcome. Um, uh, two joys, please. Uh, the first one, just a, a big thank you to everyone that turned out to the blood drive last week. Despite the, the um, challenging weather, we had a very good turnout so uh, just a big thank you. The few, uh, those that um, did um, donate, we were managed to help over 60 of our neighbors in the mm -hmm. hospital. Um, so thank you for your uh, faithfulness to that ministry. And um, just another joy, I'm officially retired. <laughs> All right, Paula. My mother-in-law is in uh, the hospital at Forbes and will have pacemaker implanted tomorrow. And her first name? Nancy. Nancy, thank you. Two things, um, my uncle Mark suffered a cardiac incident while shoveling snow this week. Um, he's okay, um, can be treated with medicine, but um, just prayers for him. And uh, another, my friend from college, Aisha, um, her brother died suddenly this week and he is in Nigeria, her home country. She's also seven months pregnant, so she cannot return to be with her family at this time. So just prayers for her. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. 
Um, just wanted to add, my dad's name is Ron. I realized I didn't put that out there at all. Um, and also, just I just have to say some praises. Um, he might end up needing a blood transfusion, so maybe, uh, you know, I'm not saying it definitely would be somebody <laughs> from who just donated, but it just touches my heart again how God orchestrates things in this congregation, and I echo what Dave just said about who are you people? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just such a wonderful group of people, um, and along with that, um, Michelle, thank you so much for the bag huge bag full of snacks that were left over that she gave to me and I was able to give to the after school kids and they loved them. Um, and that's another connection of praise. And then also I just praise God for the youth group and what they did on Sunday and Monday. And it was, I was so touched by this group of teens um, and everything that they did and how hard they worked with very little complaining, even though they were hungry. Um, and, you know, just sleeping on air mattresses. Uh, you guys, we're so blessed here. We have amazing people, amazing teenagers, amazing kids, um, and just all around, God is blessing us for that. Yesterday was three years that Debbie had her stem cell transplant. Mm. Mm. So thank you for your prayers. Yes. She's doing very well. Yes. Thank God for that. I have a friend from high school who passed away this past week. Um, I'm just asking for prayers for his family. Okay, thank you. Anything else today? One of the young uh, people uh, in March, some of you will remember that uh, it was privileged to travel to uh, Malawi and South Sudan, uh, along with some young people from around the presbytery. And uh, one of the young people who on that trip, uh, Jason, uh, his older brother was murdered uh, earlier this week in McKeesport. And so that's a family that has got to pull things together. So we pray for Jason and for the other members of that team. Yesterday, um, Levi and I were out shopping and we ran into Penny, who used to work um, with the Cross Trainers program a couple years ago. And it was just really nice. Um, I did not recognize him at first, um, but he reached out and said hello to us. So just again, like the impact that we have, um, he asked how we're doing and how the open door is. And, you know, he, he mentioned how grateful he is for the time he got to work here and is sad that he can't return and continue to help. But he seems to be doing well. Okay, thank you. Let's keep on praying. You have uh, filled our lives, oh God, with stories. And some of these stories are refrains to which we want to turn again and again. And we want to celebrate and give you thanks for the ways that you move in and through the, the rhythm and the spirit of our lives. Thank you for Michelle's new season of retirement, uh, for the youth group that just continues to grow in, uh, in intensity uh, and in, in purpose and in zeal and, and in care for one another, for the ways that we have seen healings in the lives of people that we loved, for the bonus of extra days with people like Debbie. We thank you for the stories and the connections that have come through the open door and the preschool and this congregation and for the ways that you have used the relationships that are generated here uh, to do amazing things in the lives of folks here and around the world. We lift up to you those whom we have named, John and Ron and Nancy, and Mark, Jason, for families that are in grief and who struggle, for those who wonder what to do next after a sudden death. We pray that your grace might be not only present but palpable, that your care might be not only available but tangible, and that folks would, would perceive and understand you to be a work in, your, in their lives because of the reality of folks 
who are living as Jesus would have us live. We pray for folks around the world, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Gaza, in Ukraine, and who knows how many other places where life is cheap, where decisions are being made by folks who are far, far away, and yet it's costing folks in terms of human suffering and human pain. We pray that you would make us aware of some of those connections, that you would help us to understand if we have complicity in those connections, and that you would guide us towards living more faithfully and to being more present as citizens, as neighbors, as sisters and brothers to those who suffer. Forbid, Lord, that we should think of ourselves as somehow isolated or separated from those who experience this trauma and help us to see how we are bound in this together and help us to work for the healing of the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who brings us together and invites us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As long as sisters and brothers are ill-clad and hungry, and we have more than we need, it is our task to clothe and feed them. As long as some have not heard the good news of God's love, we are called to share it. Let us give with generous hearts.
you pray with me? Generous God, we marvel at your lavish gifts to us. Life and breath, food and shelter, opportunities for work and play, and most especially, hope and peace in Christ. We now pledge ourselves to mirror and reflect the glory of your self-giving love, to continue the pattern of generosity we see perfectly revealed in Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. beloved go out into the world in peace and have courage hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil strengthen the faith hearted and support the weak help those who suffer and honor all people love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and let the whole church say amen, amen.